Thank you all for joining us for our second session, um, calling educational psychologists into using critical and multicultural research methods. Um, my name is Temi Tokbe Adelia, I go by Temi, and I specialize in student motivation. I'm currently a clinical assistant professor, and I'm also an assistant director of the Blue Sky Teaching and Learning Lab in the Honors College at Purdue University. Um, Allison, how about you introduce yourself? Yeah, um, so I'm Allison. I'm a postdoc at UC Davis, um, generally interested in uh, learning processes, how identity and context are a part of that, um, and most importantly, why I'm here thinking about um, ways to do better, um, more responsible research. Great, thanks. So, um... In session one, we unpack research paradigms, and today in session two, we'll be discussing impact before design. And the aim of the session is to consider what impact we want to make with our research and investigation so that we can design our methodologies towards that aim. Now, before we get in, I'm sharing my screen so that we can look at our, I'm sorry, this is blocking, so that we can look at our agenda for the day. Um, so today we will be learning about research impact and hearing from our panelists about how they design their um, research methodologies for impact. Then we'll discuss research impact in our breakout rooms, engage our panel in some final Q&A, and then we'll hear about what's next in our series. And so you can scan this QR code or go to the link that's been dropped in the chat a few times, but um, the bit.ly link is up here for your convenience, because in that larger folder, that's where we're going to be keeping all of our materials for these sessions. So there's materials from session one, as well as um, a folder for session two, which has the document that we'll be working out of today. Now, before we jump in, I did want to um, just help us learn about some of the ways that we're defining our definitions of multicultural and critical research. And so starting out with multiculturalism, we're defining that as a search to elevate perspectives that have been silenced in traditional scholastic narratives. And moreover, multiculturalism attempts to invite in the histories and experiences of people and cultures that have been left out of the curriculum. And then whenever it comes to critical research, um, Marvin Lynn sees critical research as rooted in critical race theory. And CRT began in law, so from this perspective, critical scholarship is a critique of race and racism in the law and in the broader society. Now, given that we're in the field of educational psychology and we study learning, um, when we apply this concept to, or this perspective to educational psychology, we view critical scholarship in ed psych as a critique of race and racism in learning environments. And learning environments is used broadly, wherever you view learning taking place, that's a place that you can engage in critical research. Now, disclaimer, Allison and I started this workshop series with the aim of learning how to engage in responsible research that centers multiculturalism and critical scholarship. And so this definition is not the definition of critical scholarship in its site, but instead it's our very concise statement of our current understanding. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, at the end of each session, there'll be a long list because our you know, attendees have so much knowledge and they drop resources. And so if you wanna learn more about critical race theory, about critical research, research in education, there'll be lots of resources because honestly the definition that was given is not necessarily doing good service to the vast research that's been done in education since um, the scholarship began. And so here I have another quote from Lynn that says that critical race researchers must turn from a problem posing orientation to a problem solving orientation. And so similar to the call that Allison and I are putting out, we're calling on education scholars to be dissatisfied with offering critique for the sake of critique. And I included this quote because um, the definition given talks a lot about critique, but as I mentioned, there has been a lot of research done in education addressing critical approaches to research. And from that research, we've learned so much about the problems that racism causes. And more importantly, acknowledging the impacts of racism draws on the assumption that racism, sexism, all the other negative and oppressive isms um, are rooted in structural and systemic problems. And so um, this allows for researchers to move beyond deficit framings that blame individuals for the problems they face. And instead, we're calling in researchers to start questioning and challenging the structures and systems that perpetuate the problems that our learners, parents, educators, and any other individual that you see as relevant in the learning environment you investigate are facing. 
And so we include this here to say that it's time for us to move beyond saying that there is a problem, because I think if you're on this call, you've agreed that yes, indeed, there is a problem whenever it comes to these oppressive systems, and instead start posing solutions. How do we create learning environments that invite marginalized perspectives into and elevate the voices and their experiences? So I'll pause there and turn it back over to Allison so that you can introduce our panelists and we can get into some good discussion. Excellent, thanks so much. So we are so excited to have um, our three panelists here with us today. Um, we have Dr. Raithi Kumar, who is a professor of educational psychology at the University of Toledo. Dr. Julissa Muniz, Muniz, who is a provost early career postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Educational Psychology, also an affiliate of the Texas Center for Equity and Promotion at the University of Texas at Austin and Dr. Mika Williams-Johnson, who is a professor of educational research at Georgia Southern University. So with this first question for our panelists, I'm going to ask for two things. The first is if each of you could, in about a sentence, I know that's probably impossible, um, but tell us uh, a summary of your research interests or your program. And second, why do you engage in critical and multicultural research? How does that inform um, your research questions? And so I'll throw that into the chat just in case that's helpful. Um, I think, why don't we start with, um, we'll go Dr. Kumar, Dr. Muniz, and Dr. Um, Williams Johnson. So a uh, one sentence summary of my research interests. Well, when I think about it over the past 25 or more years, this has been my passion, this has been my interest, and I've examined issues of social inequality, inequity that, that occurs in education, and uh, mainly with, and I've worked with cultural minority and immigrant adolescents, and of course, exploring what schools, administrators, and teachers can do to create an environment where all students, <clears throat> regardless of, uh, of their background, they feel welcome. They feel that they are part of this uh, of the school context. So that that's essentially framed my research for ever since I, have a, I was a graduate student. Um, would you like me to see? Would you want me to answer the second question as well? Well, uh, why do I engage in this kind of research? And uh, I have to I have to tell you this, and I think this is important for those of us who are thinking of research or doing research, I was, I never, uh, when I was, when I was back in India, I never thought of these issues in quite the same way till I came to the US. And I'll tell you why, because uh, there I was, uh, you know, I never realized the, uh, the advantages I accrued because I came from a highly educated family and, uh, and, so these were, you know, it was easy to say, oh, I don't believe in casteism because India there is caste. It was when I came to the US, it was, it was really interesting that I found that suddenly I realized how different I am. And I still remember Frankfurt airport when I looked at myself and looked at my kids and said, oh my God, everyone looks so different and realized I'm different. But I think that sort of sowed the seeds, but later on coming here, the experiences I had, the experiences my daughter had, it just, there were so many questions when you talk about research questions. And it started out with my own experiences. I said, how do you relate to people who are so different and how do others relate to you? How do other, how can others understand you? And that's when, you know, you're like a fish that is in water, it's ubiquitous. But when you're getting thrown into a different culture, then you start understanding your own culture. It increases your cultural awareness. So in, in those ways, I was very fortunate that I became aware of these things. And, uh, and so I started out with saying, why do students experience dissonance between home and self? What is that cultural dissonance? And that was the passion that has always fueled whatever I've done. And, you know, just how can we make school a happy place for children? And, uh, and so, yes, uh, my, all my questions revolve around that. I'll start. Um, hello, everyone. It is lovely to be here with you all. Um, so I would say, and I'm going to try to stay as close to the minute or the one sentence, um, but I would say, broadly speaking, my work looks at issues of identity, positive youth development, 
educational equity and racial justice at the intersection of education, the juvenile legal and the criminal legal system. Um, so my previous work was a critical ethnographic study of a juvenile detention center, looking at the types of learning environments that are created within carceral spaces. Um, but more importantly, how young people experience those spaces and in what ways does that then inform their learner identities, but also their relationship to formal education. Um, my more recent work looks at specifically Latinx familias and how families are thinking about and experiencing issues of community safety, um, violence, specifically within the Central Texas um, kind of context, and how that then informs the types of conversations that families are having and the learning that is happening within families and how that informs um, how they interact or don't interact with criminal legal systems. Um, so I very much conceive of learning broadly. I am a learning scientist by training from the social cultural tradition. Um, so I'm thinking about learning across kind of place and context. Um, I would say quite simply that my work is motivated um, and guided by the desire for racial justice. Um, I'm, the work that I do obviously most often affects Black, Latinx, and Indigenous young people. Um, so in many ways, I see my research as necessitated by the needs of our young people, specifically those who are most often marginalized and some of our most, most vulnerable and highest needs students um, who are oftentimes left out of conversations about learning. So I think I'm gonna try to follow suit and be as short as I possibly can, but I see a lot of similarities between some of our work. I think just the context may be a little bit different, but uh, a lot of my work looks um, uh, is uh, deeply wedded to emotions in teaching and learning and self-efficacy beliefs um, more broadly in traditions of educational psychology, but I, I am definitely, uh, geared towards critical race theory, Black feminist thought, and I also am um, really interested in parental involvement and homeschooling and alternative forms of education. Overall, I'm interested in uh, what my participants uh, might define um, as educational pathways toward liberation. What do they define or contribute to building an educational experience and um, how do they define that liberation for them? So that's where um, I come from when I start with uh, a lot of my work. And then what draws me to it um, um, or informs my work and my research, uh, I am um, geared towards responsible engagement towards uh, our research. I was a teacher for several years before I went back for my a PhD, and I was, when I was teaching, I was thinking some of the stuff that they taught us, you know, in my pre-service teaching, it's just, it's not working. I don't know what's happening, but this is not working. And so I need to figure out what, what we could do to um, better inform and prepare some of our pre-service teachers. So I went to graduate school with that in mind, um, but I, I want to make sure that we share research um, that will help inform our researchers, our teachers, our principals, broaden their ideas and positions about the families that we serve. And that's it. Thank you all so much for starting us off with those thoughts. The next question that I'd love to pose to all of you um, is what are your perspectives on how research questions should be framed and situated in critical and multicultural research. So this time, why don't we start with um, Dr. Muniz, we'll move to uh, Dr. Williams Johnson and then Dr. Kumar. So I have a couple of thoughts that I like jotted down. Let's see if I can make sense of my own scribbles um, and see how I was trying to make sense of these connections. Um, so in thinking about this question, I think one thing that came to mind for me was the importance of also, I guess, beginning with, a, beginning with attention to self and asking yourself, like, what, what brings you to the types of questions that you want to ask? And I think 
And I, and I won't take credit for this activity at all. This was actually an activity that I had to do in graduate school. Um, and it was, a, it was an assignment that um, Dr. Nancy Hill gave us, which was this racial, um, it was like a research identity memo. And she wanted us to start by first thinking about who we are as a researcher, both our you know, strengths of the identities that we carry and not just like racial ethnic identities, but also, right, what are other social identities that inform the types of questions um, you're interested in? And with that, right, like with the strengths also, what are some biases that you might carry into your work? And from there, right, like begin with the first kind of reflective self, like where are you starting from? And what are the more natural types of questions you might lean towards? But also what are some other types of questions you might naturally try to steer away from, but why? Why are you steering away from those types of questions? Um, and I feel like that was really critical for me to like do and kind of just write out for myself. And in that process, right, I wrote that probably one of my biases going into the type of work that I was interested in was that I am more inclined to believe young people always and to center young people always. And so what are some of the potential blind spots of the type of questions that I might be asking? And I think doing that exercise was really helpful, right? Like having, acknowledging both my own bias of perhaps I might not be listening to some of the other organizational actors in these spaces. Um, but I think even just naming that from the onset allowed me to move into the space um, with a level of openness. And I think that brings me to kind of um, the types of research questions that you develop. Um, and I think that research questions should be kind of, I don't know if flexible is the word, right? But I think that research questions evolve with time, right? They evolve. If you're doing field work, right, they're going to change because of what you're experiencing in the field, right? It's going to, it should attend to what you're hearing in the field, right? And so, my suggestion would be like, even if you have a set of research questions that you're going into your project with, being open to that kind of like dialogue with the learning environment itself, right? What are you taking away? And what are maybe some things that um, you didn't think you would attend to? So for example, like I'm thinking about my most recent study. I didn't go into my study thinking that I would study whiteness or white racial identity development. That was something that came from being in the field and being in conversation with young people, particularly white youth who were incarcerated and their sense making around issues of identity and criminality. And it wasn't that I came in and was like, all right, I'm about to study whiteness um, or not whiteness in, in relation to white racial identity development, but also acknowledging that part of my own learning as a researcher in these spaces is to be able to move through and make changes as the work kind of necessitates it. Um, so I think those are kind of like two kind of suggestions that I would say. And also the other thing that I might add to that is that when thinking about the like framing, also right during that time, also thinking about what are some of the theories that you'll draw on? Because that theory can also inform and help strengthen the types of questions you're developing in that process. Um, and that's why it's important to also being open to combining theories, right? Because no one theory might is going to help you analyze the data correctly. And I know for me, I've always kind of taken an approach of taking theories and bringing them together, perhaps in ways that the field wouldn't have put them together. Um, but for the type of work that I'm interested in, right, like I felt it was necessary to bridge institutional theory to critical race theory, two types of theories that oftentimes sit in very one different disciplines, but also different centering, right? So one might look more at institutions and organizations, whereas CRT, right, very much is encouraging you to also look at the experiential knowledges of people in those spaces. Um, so that would be kind of my my advice as it relates to that question. So uh, to follow, I would say uh, I definitely agree. It is a reflective process as you are moving forward in you know your development and thinking through 
you know, your topic and how you might be able to gather some of the data. I think it's definitely reflective. Generally, I start with some kind of social justice lens. I, that's just, I guess, one of the ways in which um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking through this education for liberation kind of paradigm and moving with uh, social justice to either um, have people think differently about their perspectives or ways in which we can make change. Because I do want us to um, try to work together as much as possible in creating situations where our students and our teachers enjoy the journey of learning. What we see now is a lot of folks who are languishing. And I, I think that there's much more that we could do to try and figure out new ways and different alternatives to enjoy the journey. Uh, and I know that's kind of lofty language, but it's possible. Um, and, and we need to think differently, critically um, about these issues. Well, I agree with the, both of you, but, and uh, there was one thing that uh, uh, really resonated with me was the interdisciplinary approach that you talked about. I think that is uh, really important. And uh, when we are looking at, when we are developing our research questions and we are interested in social justice, we are interested in uh, issues of equity. I, it's, it's really good to adopt, uh, you know, the, the, the research project itself should be embedded in a, in a larger conceptual model, a conceptual model that incorporates uh, a, an interdisciplinary framework. And, uh, and that's what I have tried to do in my own work. And what I have found is that, you know, these, many of these theories, they are talking, they're saying the same thing, but approaching it from different directions. And that really helps. And I would say that even as we um, become, you know, I, I do think all educational psychologists, we should be familiar with the theories in other disciplines like sociology. We should know critical race theory. And at the same time, I think we can also, so we should also appreciate the things that are there in psychology. And I say this, um, recognizing the, um, really the the racist roots of some of of uh, of many of our theories and so forth but it, despite that i would say that in psychology if you look at for example intergroup contact hypothesis or social dominance theory and indeed if you look at the work of uh, cultural psychologists like developmental psychologists like rogoff they really embed their research work and research questions within the cultural context. And when I say they embed it within the culture, with, when I say Rogoff, for example, embeds it within a, a, a cultural context, it's going in and asking questions. It is, of course, we have to be passionate and interested in what we do, but is this of interest? Is How is it going to help the people we are, uh, we are trying to work with? How, how should we collaborate so that this really helps people in, in a positive way? Because ultimately, what is the educational psychology research? It's all about building relationships with schools. It is working on issues that's of interest to our students, um, you know, whether all our students or the different student groups, administrators, teachers. So I think it's good to bear that in mind as we think of conducting research. So that's been one of my major um, major things that I that I do take into account. What is how will this help the people that I'm interested? I'm really interested in their issues, but I have to learn from them. And then that and the flexibility that was mentioned, I think that's important because during the project, there you know, you cannot stay so rigid because when you use, for example, mixed methodology, it's going to take you in different directions sometimes because you learn things if you're doing, as I did, an exploratory mixed methods model. These are such helpful thoughts and ideas. Um, the last question I'd love to ask you all for now is how do you have conversations both with students, and that could be in teaching, mentorship, or research capacities, and also other collaborators on considering the impact they seek to have before designing critical and multicultural research? 
So this time, let's start with Dr. Williams Johnson. We'll then go to Dr. Kumar and Dr. Muniz. So, and I think this is an interesting question. I don't know so much that it's a focus on the impact. Um, much of my work is, is consulting with the groups that you have listed and we're talking about the topic and what ways we could either gather data, or analyze data or something. And sometimes we do have, you know, what would be most influential either to the field, to our department, you know, to the students. Um, and generally we kind of take it from, you know, what would be in terms of the goal and working through the goal of this particular study. Is it to, you know, solve a um, particular problem within this school? You know, is it an action research situation? Is it a grant perspective to, you know, fund programs? And we kind of work with the purpose, um, but influence, I think, is more of my uh, direct focus rather than impact. Now, some people might say, well, that's, you know, um, you know, just a, a, a little wordsmithing there. But honestly, sometimes your influence might be local, but it has great change. Um, sometimes impact, we want to see an impact factor, but sometimes I, I often wonder, well, what does that really mean? Like, there's more hands on the document, but you don't know if those people are really reading it, using it, and what have you. So you want to have some influence within your field. And your influence, you know, just by the term that people are thinking, engaging with it, and using that information in ways that will um, show some kind of progress, gain, or development. And so I usually work towards influence, and generally the influence is to see some kind of progressive change within our communities, whether it's student academic progress, um, teacher engagement and, and uh, emotions where we're learning more from teachers and hearing more about their engagement with their students and some of the emotion and frustration or even some of the pride that they have within their work to um, associate with change. But these are influential factors that I think that um, mostly make a difference. So I want to do work that is situated in seeing observable differences um, and rather than just having something for out there as a traditional idea of an impact factor. Well, I'm going to take a slightly different take on uh, uh, how do you design this multicultural research? And if, you, if you're designing the, a, a project, let's say, how are you going to do that? And I think, um, and who are you going to collaborate with? And what role do the collaborators play? And uh, one of the things yeah, that both it's students, maybe it could be students or other faculty, but how, how you know how are you consider taking all that into account? For one, I have to first say that I was I've been really blessed both with collaborators and students, particularly they were all, I mean, they were all committed to equity and social justice. So it was a good team to work with. And uh, even with students, it was um, the students who really got engaged with, uh, in my, with my work. They were, um, particularly if you're going to be doing things like conducting interviews, for example, it's part of your research design. You want to conduct interviews and you have uh, students from um, whether it is higher education or whether it's in school, students from different groups, for example. So if you're going into a culturally diverse school, I would say that we got to think those issues out about who we are engaging. So for example, I really work towards finding some uh, racial ethnic compatibility between the interviewer and the interviewee. In fact, I did not go in and conduct every interview. I was just the silent note taker, the fly on the wall, because I felt uh, student, you know, when you're interviewing uh, students, any group, they should feel an absolute comfort. You've got to establish that. And I'm going to take a step back. Even before you start the research, let's say you want to work with different groups, 
you got to go and meet people in the community. You got to meet people who know them well. And all that is, a, you know, you got to, one has to do all that initial work. So, um, go and talk to parents. So go for, to the parent-teacher conference, for example, and explain what you're doing. And just a simple example, I was uh, working with uh, Arab children. Now, when I had, when I was going to work with Arab children, you know all the prejudice and discrimination that is, that is associated with these groups. So of course, parents are concerned about, okay, what are you going to come and ask my children? What are you going to do? And uh, so, Actually, I, I actually talked to people in the community. I shared the interview protocol. I shared this. I said, these are the questions I'm asking. And these are what I'll be asking your children. And so I did that with every group. And I think uh, so. Uh, that sort of planning is important, particularly if we are doing critical, um, critical work. And the reason I say that, we, the whole idea is you want to listen to people's voices. What are their experiences in this context? How are, what is happening to them? And if we want to do that, we got to create that space that is really comfortable where people can talk about their experiences. They can tell their counter narratives and stories. So the same school, different groups are going to have different experiences and they're going to talk only if that context is comfortable. And so I think uh, thinking through all those things is really important. And uh, there has to be a, a lot of communication between among the uh, um, people working on the project and uh, also sustained interest because this takes time. And so all those things figure into thinking about designing uh, multicultural research. Some of the things. Um, so I, I'll try to be quick so that I know that we're, we're trying to move on to the next portion of this, but um, and also because I, there's no need to like echo some of the things that have already been said, but one of the things that comes to mind with this question um, and something that I think was important for me, especially when I was dissertating and, you know, sometimes when you're writing your dissertation, you kind of lose sight of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, and so a question that I feel is important very early on is like, who is this in service of? And, and continuously like revisiting that why. In fact, when I was writing my dissertation, I had on note cards on my bulletin board in front of me, like, who is this, who is this in service of? Like, who is this for? Who is my audience? Almost as these like reminders in the writing process, because sometimes you're like writing and you're just like, what am I actually writing about? Like you look up and you're like, I've lost kind of the direction of what is, what I'm actually trying to say and why I'm trying to say this. Um, and so I think that that kind of guiding question and, and continuously revisiting that why. And I think especially in early in the early stages of developing a project, um, one thing that I would highly recommend for students is also spending time reading before jumping into your work. Um, one of the most influential books that I would say for my work was um, Humanizing Pedagogies by edited, it's an edited volume by Maisha Wynn and Django Paris. Um, and one of the reasons why I love that book so much was because it was these incredible examples of scholars in the field at different levels, you know, senior scholars, mid-career scholars, early scholars, really grappling with this idea of what does it mean to do humanizing work? And how do you center humanizing pedagogies and approaches in your design? Um, because I think sometimes in our programs, you know, if I'm specifically talking to students, humanizing pedagogies aren't always present in our curriculum, right? And so it seems like you're the only one trying to do justice oriented work when in fact, there's an entire community of scholars everywhere trying to do that work, but we often are in these silos. And so it's hard to see what's out there. Um, and so for me, that text was really influential to like, just helping guiding what, what, what does it mean to do humanizing work? And for everyone that's gonna look different depending on the type of work that you do. And so spending time thinking about like, well, what does humanizing pedagogy look like if I study motivation? or if I study learning, you know, and, and asking yourself that, um, 
Um, and then I think the other part of this question that I wanted to like name is that I think thinking about impact can sometimes be overwhelming, especially when you're an early career scholar, um, right? I think that's when sometimes you get this like anxiety of like, who, why am I doing this? No one even reads this article that's cited by five people, right? And so then you start having an existential crisis because you're like, who am I doing this for? Um, and so I think impact, and I think something that we need to do better is also thinking about like the moment to moment shifts that are happening, um, rather than like thinking about impact as always research, policy, and practice, right? Which is, I think, the traditional which way in which we're trained to think about our work um, and impact. But also impact is the types of dialogues that you're able to have with your peers, right? And, and now you perhaps um, influence someone else's thinking and how they're thinking about the, their projects, right? So that's also an impact. Um, you know, when you're talking to your peers, when you're talking to junior people, um, and also like impact is sometimes the immediacy of taking back some of your findings to the very stakeholders who you are working with, right? And even if it's not solicited, writing up like, hey, this one page document of like, here's some of the takeaways from my study that I think could benefit you and your staff or your practitioners. And I'm happy to sit with you all right. and to walk you through my thinking of why this might be helpful. Um, and that's also impact, right? So I think, especially for those of us that are more junior scholars, like, yeah, our work right now probably does not have policy impact, right? Like there's five people reading our articles, but maybe one day, right? That, that's like aspirational of what we hope will happen. But I think, also acknowledging those those more minute forms of impact. Amazing. Thank you all so much for thinking through these questions and ideas with us. Um, we'll have some time to engage the panelists with questions from all of you, our attendees, shortly. Um, but first, I want to allow some time to do some work and really digest um, these ideas that the panelists were introducing. Um, so we're going to start moving into some small groups. So I'm going to pass things along to Temi to introduce the breakout room work. Yeah, I really enjoyed this so far. I was like frantically taking notes because there was so much gold, so much gold was dropped. Um, but yeah, so we're going to be going into breakout rooms where we will all have a chance to answer three questions that seem small, but will lead into some really deep conversations. And so as I'm explaining this, feel free to pull out that article that we mentioned at the beginning, whether it's your own work or work in drafted form or someone else's work that really inspires you, because we'll be looking through some of the methods and the research questions that were posed to help us think about um, what, what, what was the impact. And I liked how a lot of the panelists talked about impact as more than impact factors and what where is our research going to more so thinking about um, who are we trying to serve? What is our intended audience and what influence do we wanna have? And so that's the approach we're hoping you'll take as you're looking through what these scholars are saying. But anyway, um, we have 13, 12 breakout rooms and they're by your birth month. So I will open the room shortly and you'll just jump into whatever room is the month that you were born in. And I will drop the link once more to the folder that you'll be in. And then there's also um, at the top of that document, a link to a Jamboard. And so that's a great way for you all to be taking notes of what you're thinking about, as well as to list any questions that you have um, that come up during your discussions. Thank you all so much for your work in those rooms. Um, we would love for you all to throw uh, any questions you have for the panelists in the chat, maybe some that came up um, during your breakout room work. And while you do that, um, Temi and I sourced a few from the registrations so that we can start with those with our panelists. Um, so would love to start off for our panelists thinking about um, what recommendations do you have for how to advocate for multicultural and critical approaches to research when you are not necessarily in charge of the project? Um, and so that might be in instances uh, for, for example, grad students with advisors um, or maybe researchers with colleagues who 
um, who don't necessarily quite yet see the value in this work. They might think it's too soon to approach these challenges. They might say that race or gender are outside of the scope of this work. Um, what are your recommendations for that? And feel free, the three of you, to just jump in um, or not as you'd like on these. It's interesting that you ask this question because uh, it may, takes me takes me back to my own experiences as a graduate student. Uh, I mean, um, don't get me wrong, I was in the most wonderful place for motivation. It was the hub for motivation, University of Michigan. But uh, I don't, at, at that time, nobody was really speaking about culture. And here I was interested in cultural dissonance and wanting to study this. And, under, and I, I actually ended up con conducting interviews with uh, students who said that. And I was told that I, at that time, that was not considered publishable. It was not considered as a mixed method study. It was not publishable. But you know, I think so um, I guess if uh, if you do if you find that uh, that you're having uh, that you know that you're uh, that you're not being encouraged to en engage in this and if this is and uh, you're you you're sure you want to do this I think you should persist and uh, some of the ways was I. I really, I, I remember uh, talking to faculty, talking to other faculty, bringing them in and saying that this is what I want to do. And uh, really, I mean, trying to uh, try to make sure that uh, they, we are all on the same page. And if you are not, then you have to, as a student, you can see what action you need to take. But it requires persistence and passion to do for what you're doing. But I think if you're concerned about this, it's important and you should pursue it. So in Georgia, they're still <laughs> having a hard time accepting that some of these things are, are important uh, within our schools. Um, and we, we're almost on the brink, similar to uh, Florida. You know, the Florida decided to get rid of uh, African-American studies within their um, high school programs. Georgia hasn't done that yet, but trust me, it's constantly a threat, it's, a, it's an ever-present threat. Um, and I will say for many of my colleagues as we work with uh, within our College of Education, I tell them educational equity is a possibility. It is up to us to make sure that we could do everything that we can to usher that in. So sometimes it's about wording things and I use the, you know, um, certain phrases like research to encourage change something like that. And using that language, I guess, gives people a little more freedom and or permission to move within that light. So uh, if we're trying to address a uh, public attitude, policy, or values, you know, we need to consider what is it that we could do with our research to encourage change. And um, I, I take seriously my responsibility for preparing teachers. I had a, um, a student who called me in October. She started teaching and she had, you know, what I thought was a dream job. Dream job, teaching first grade, you know, I'm thinking she's loving life. But if she called me in October and said, I, I can't do this, it's, this is nothing like what I thought it would be. There's, you know, differences that I didn't expect. Um, and I can't necessarily work with some of the kids that need it the most, but if my kids don't show progress, then that's, you know, definitely it rests on my shoulders. I was not prepared for the gravity of the problems and I have social emotional issues within my classroom and I can't really reach out to some of my parents. And it, it was a long list and she was just miserable. And I was like, well, just keep on with it and you can do it and let's take a look at this problem, but let's just keep moving. And by December, she quit. She left the babies. I was like, you, you can't just leave them. And she did. And she just felt so unprepared. And I take that responsibility very seriously. We have got to make sure that our, our students are well prepared for the realities that they will face when they take that leadership in the classroom. And so it is this kind of research and, you know, uh, um, 
introducing them to that and having them ask these kind of critical questions and finding the resources so they could better be better prepared as well as when they're in the classroom they can ask the kind of questions that they need to get the resources for their support and so it, it i think it's at a, a critical nature now where we should do all that we can to do research to encourage change thank you Um, so I was trying to think, well, I feel like maybe because I was just a grad student, I'm thinking about all the different pivots within my own journey. Um, so when I applied to grad school, I applied in my statement saying that I wanted to very specifically look at teaching and learning and identity development within carceral classrooms. I was accepted with that project and I was brought into the program. When I got into my program, I kept meeting with faculty and the first thing they would tell me, they're like, Julie, so that's going to be really hard. They're going to be like, why don't you do a project in an alternative school? Or why don't you do a project in a, um, a high poverty, primarily black and brown, you know, urban school? And I'm like, that's not what I said I wanted to do. Um, so being who I am, um, I just stopped telling people what I was about to do. And I started, there's a saying in Spanish um, that's, that says like, es mejor pedir perdón que permiso. It's better to ask um, forgiveness than permission. I, I'm not always the best at translating things, but that, in my mind, that's what it is. Um, so I started operating from a place of fugitivity, right? And I was like, you know what? Let me continue doing what I said I was going to do and I'll come back to you all once I've figured it out. Um, so for a year, I continued to make the relationships um, in the community that I needed to be able to do the project. So I started volunteering as a prison monitor in the state. So I would visit different prisons throughout the um, state and I was coming in in a monitoring capacity to ensure that um, their you know, human rights were being violated. And in doing so, I was establishing relationship with different prisons, carceral spaces. Um, and it was through that process that I identified a juvenile detention center that I'm like, look, this is actually the ideal space for my work. Um, in part, because I wanted to ensure that there was, in addition to black youth, Latinx youth represented within the population of young people. Um, so I started organizing meetings. I don't know what I was doing, but I was out here trying to get my project done. So I started meeting with different stakeholders. Um, I met with the chief judge. I met with the superintendent, uh, which are technically the wardens of juvenile detention centers. I came up with a one page document that outlined what project I wanted to do and presented that to them. And so I got an MOU in hand saying that I had the chief judge's permission to do this research study. So then I went to IRB and was like, I'm ready to move forward with my IRB. That took eight months. Um, and in that process, I would, finally was telling my mentors at the time, I'm like, look, I have an MOU in hand. So tell me I can't do this project. And in some ways, right, that did force their hand into accepting my project because what they told me wasn't going to be possible became possible. And so I say that to say, and I ended up with the dream team of a, of a um, dissertation committee. Also, the other thing I'll say to grad students, read your handbook, because if you know the policies in the handbook, you know what you can advocate for. So I realized that I only needed one person within my program to be on my committee. Everyone else, it just had to be two people from the university and I could have an external member. So I assembled the committee that I thought would better support me as a scholar in my research project. And I was following the guidebook. And that's how I made my project come to life. It wasn't because I initially had all the support in place. And then from there, I secured funding. Um, I got the Soros Fellowship. So I, they really couldn't say anything, right? At this point, I had the funding. I had an MOU. I had an IRB. So I was like, tell me that I can't do this project. Right. And so sometimes you also do have to, you're, you're, well, one, you're, you're a grown ass adult. So, like, you also have agency in 
that, right? And so I think owning that agency and saying like, no, like I understand. And I think sometimes it's not, it's not um, bad intention when people try to gear you towards another project. They really are trying to look out for you, but sometimes they're also not listening to what your heart's work is. And so that's when you need to figure out for yourself, like, what is your heart's work? And if your heart's work aligns with, like, with next steps, then do that. Um, because ultimately, these spaces weren't created for all of us. And so now that we're here, it's on us to kind of push those boundaries of the type of work that we can do. Just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean it can't be done. Oh, that was so elegantly put. And I, that's what I meant when I said persist, because sometimes you're not, not everyone is going to advocate your interest in this. But if you think this is what you should do and this is the right thing to do, then trying and uh, try to find someone who will support you and then you can go from there. But uh, it does require some persistence and some sometimes it's hard, but you got to be able to do that. Thank you. Well, panelists, we so appreciate your time and your thoughts so far. We'd love if you could leave us with one last thought uh, in about a sentence. Um, what do you want people to carry with them as they start or continue pursuing critical and multicultural research? Um, so let's start with Dr. Williams Johnson. Do not be afraid, be brave, be bold and get the job done. We're, we're, we're here, we need to hear from you. Dr. Kumar? Yes. Um, uh, something I, I would like to uh, talk about something that came up in our discussion, which I thought was uh, good. And that was, the question was how, where do critical race theory and educational psychology, where is the link and how do we do that? And one of the things that I, that we, that came out of our discussions, what are the tenets of uh, critical race theory when you talk about, uh, yes, recognizing that there is racism. So we have to uh, work to, do, you know, towards empowering our students, marginalized students, that we need to hear counter stories. And so and so that we know that there isn't just this one norm, but that there are multiple ways of looking at things. And I think we can look at educational psychology constructs, whether it is in motivation, emotion, whatever the things we are looking at, we can look at it through a critical race theory lens. And I think that's where the two meet. And so I just wanted to share that. Um, I would just say, like, don't lose sight of your why. Um, maybe write it down somewhere where you're going to continuously see it. For me, it was like my bulletin board that, you know, when I sit at my desk, that's the first thing I see in the morning. Um, but write it down because I feel like one of, you know, one of the ancient artifacts of these institutions is that there's almost like this inherent, almost like dehumanization process in it. And so like, I don't know, whatever is gonna get you through this, this piece of the journey. Um, so yeah, don't lose sight of your why, like what brought you to grad school to begin with and what brought you to the work that you care about and revisit that why when you start to lose sight of that. Amazing, well, thank you all so much. Let's show our appreciation by everyone throwing up an emoji, a reaction something um, I wanted to just go back to what Julissa just said so the um the whole idea of why one of my um old professors Dr. Asa Hilliard at um, Georgia State University he had a huge office and on his on his walls he had these pictures of his students past students or whatever and I've tried to emulate that and so on my walls, I have all these graduation pictures of all my students. And I just love it when I walk into my office and I see those pictures and I'm just like, okay, this is what it's all about. And then I open up the emails and I get, <laughs> it brings me to reality again, but I remember I'm looking at the walls and I love seeing those happy faces on that um, in these graduation photos. So thanks for that. 
Thanks for adding that piece in that our why doesn't always have to be about the outreach of the research, but also as um, you were sharing earlier, like whose knowledge am I impacting and how am I sharing my knowledge beyond our lab? So yes, I loved all of that. And to the, those who are asking about the link between critical research and educational psychology, Dr. Dakir Gumby, who was on this call, has literally written the book on it. There's been so many other scholars who've been engaged in this work for decades. And so I empathize with that question because I was the same way until I went to ARA last year and finally was able to learn about researchers who for decades have been doing this work. And so regardless of whether you're getting this training in your program or whether you can make it to the rest of these sessions, I really encourage you to have that starting place of finding a handbook. They're linked in our session one materials. I'll add them to the session two materials just so it's easier for you to access. Um, we had a lot of scholars share some great resources on how do you get started, how do you start finding methodologies um, that can help you design your research with impact in mind whenever it comes to critical and multicultural research. Um, so let me share my screen so I can let y'all know what's coming up next. So this was session two that you attended today. And next month we'll be starting session three and that's where we'll be talking more about, oh, this is today's session, sorry. Um, we'll be talking in session three more about um, methods, but now we'll be talking about how do you align methods in critical and multicultural education research with the aim of engaging in um, critical work. And so this is where we'll be learning about methodologies, survey measures, um, ways to design your research with your critical intentions, influences, and impacts in mind. So definitely come out to the session where we'll have Drs. Coakley, Dakir Gumby, and Adams Wiggins talking about how they designed some of their research um, for this exact aim in educational psychology. Um, I'm also going to share another event that I got in my email just in case you're like, oh no, February 21st is too far away. Don't worry, the International so uh, Society of Learning Sciences is having a similar session. I believe it's gonna be more so focused on computing and computer learning, but still relevant. Um, they're having a session called Designing to Disrupt, Creating Space for the Work That Matters to You. And so this is really going off of the calls we were getting from our panelists today about persisting and not letting a lack of access to training stop you or lack of access to permission stop you from engaging in work. So um, I will drop a link to this in the chat once I stop sharing my screen and so that you can look into it and register if you're interested. And then lastly, um, one of our co-organizers, Corinthia Nikolai, I always call her Corey, so that came out a little weird, but Corey has developed a resource on positionality, and so that's also linked in the document. If you're starting to want to go beyond just talking in breakout rooms about your views on race, racism, and structural inequalities, start um, working, so you can look into that document to consider developing your positionality statement so we can engage in some of the processes our um, panelists talked about in the beginning of this session, which involves self-reflection and considering how your own experiences positions you to engage in critical and multicultural research. So I'm um, dropping the link to that session. Now is the time for you to drop any other uh, resources that you have. I see that we got a quick plug in here to ARA and ARA Motivation SIG and APA Division 15. This is a co-sponsored event. And so we are hoping to continue to collaborate across um, organizations because we have so much great knowledge to share between these orgs. And so thank you to members, organizers, leaders, and both of those APA Division 15. Oh, I don't know what I said. Oh, I didn't say the Race and Diversity Committee part. My bad. Um, specifically, the Race and Diversity Committee um, in APA Division 15. So thank you so much to all of our panelists and to everyone who joined us. Have a great weekend.